So good morning, my name is Damian Marion. I work for Cisco, for Chief Technology Architecture Office. I'm uh, working with VPP for more than two years. Initially, I was a user of, of that code. At that time, it was a closed source corporate uh, uh, stuff, but now it's open source. And then after that, I started working on, on actually coding the, the, and working on, on VPP full time. So today I will talk a bit about uh, VPP architecture. So idea today is to talk about uh, technical details, why we are doing some stuff, what we have in VPP and so on. So I will start actually some, with something which you already see, <coughs> seen in the previous presentation and that is about the, the, the packet processing. So what we typically have in the, in the most of the, the network, network uh, network uh, stuff today is uh, really the scalar packet processing. It's, it's really about, uh, it's really about uh, processing, uh, it's a fancy name actually for processing the single packet at a time. And this is, this is very common in, in many commercial products, also in open source and so on. And it comes to the several issues when we are talking about scalar packet processing. So, Mainly what already Jerome mentioned is uh, about the utilization of the instruction cache on the, on the CPU. And also the read latency, which is of course the cost of, the cost of really, uh, fetching the data from the memory or, or from the cache hierarchy. And, uh, and of course, if you, have, if you are processing every packet uh, separately, you are basically multiplying those two issues per packet. They always exist, but if you are doing packet by packet, this is, this is really a cost for every single packet. So this is very important when we are talking about this. If you want to do 40 million packets per second on the single CPU core, let's say it's a 3.5 gigahertz, you actually have a budget of 250 cycles per packet. So what this means? That means that in 250 uh, cycles per packet, you need to do everything. You need to, to receive packet, you need to dequeue the packet from the receiver ring. You need to do uh, operations of the packet, including the table lookups. You need to update the layer two header. You need to dispatch packet to the transmit, transmit queue of the NIC. Or if you are doing the virtualization, then you need to dispatch the packet to the, to the, to the some para virtualized interface or something else. So really, it's only 250 clock cycles per packet. And when we are do, doing VPP, this is basically the most important thing we are taking care, care of. So whenever you're adding a new feature, you need to think about this one. Otherwise, it will just become slower and slower and slower. And we don't want to do this. This is slide actually um, taken from last year uh, DPDK Summit in Dublin. It was presentation from, from Venki from Intel. And he was showing actually data which was also published in the Intel optimization guide. It actually shows what the, the I cache and D cache uh, latency means. So we have the data for different cache hierarchies, a number of clock cycles needed to really to fetch the data. What that means, if you are fetching the data from, from the cache or from the memory, your CPU is waiting, it's not processing packets. And of course, the worst case is this one. It's basically when you are trying to read something from the memory because it's like uh, more than 70, uh, 70 nanoseconds uh, needed to basically to fetch one cache line from the memory to, to, the, to the CPU. And if you convert this value to the clock cycles, you actually see that for a two gigahertz CPU, it's like 140, uh, 140 uh, cycles just to get one cache line, and cache line is actually 64 bytes of, of data from, from memory to, to CPU. So if we have a budget of 250 for a packet, and if, if there is a 140 needed just to get one cache line from the, from the memory, then you, you cannot really do, do much in, in the rest. So that is the key here, how to reduce this and how to address the issue. And solution for this problem is really the vector packet processing, where you are basically using the different uh, software techniques to, to improve and to, to 
to avoid the, the, the issues with uh, memory latency and iCache thrashing. Uh, iCache thrashing is another problem which is also present and when you have the very large amount of the instructions which you are applying to the packet, then it will, it will, it will, it will fall out of the, of the layer one cache and that means that again you are hitting the same problem. You need to, to wait for new instructions to come back to the, to the CPU and that means that CPU is basically stalling and not doing any, any useful work. So vector packet processing is actually addressing both of them. It's about the, the optimizing the iCache and also to address the, 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 the latency of the memory and, uh, and cache hierarchy. You already heard about history, so it's basically this slide is more or less repeating. It's, uh, it's uh, basically uh, application written, started, uh, started as a project in Cisco back in 2002. Uh, there is active development since then. It was used in many uh, Cisco products inside. So, for example, on CRS1, the, the CGN, CGN uh, functionality is built on VPP. Uh, we have the virtualized router, which is called uh, ASR9KV, or codename Sunstone, which is also uh, based on VPP. It's using VPP as a data plane, and so on. And this year, we actually decided to, to open source it and to drive it as an as a, as a, uh, open source project. Uh, as everything started uh, as, a, as a actually a software which is running on the embedded systems, on the, on the real routers, from the day one, the, the, there was a really take, care taken for doing the, something which is multi-platform and Endian clean, which means that you can get the same code and run it both on the, on the little Endian and big Endian systems. You can run it on Intel, you can run it on ARM, MIPS, and so on. Another important thing is that, is that it is actually the user mode process. So it's really uh, just application running on the Linux. And I don't see uh, much issues of moving this to some other similar operating systems like BSD. Because it's, at the end, it's a really a uh, uh, Unix user mode process. Uh, DPDK actually is an important piece of the, of, the, of the whole story, but it, it actually arrived quite late. So if you look at the history of VPP, which started back in 2002, we actually started using the DPDK in 2013. So all the period before that, actually, VPP had his own device drivers. And we were maintaining device drivers for different NICs. And we, all, we, we, we still have that infrastructure in VPP. And actually, the, the whole DPDK subsystem is, is just a one device driver in VPP, which is used for talking to, to support techniques in DPDK. This is basically the, the slide you already saw before. Uh, I would maybe move this on top of the, of the network I.O. But this is basically the, how it fits. So basically, we have a networking stack doing the packet processing, and then we have a DPDK, which is uh, for us uh, uh, network I.O. layer to speak with the, with the supported hardware. And now we are coming to the most important and uh, the black magic which is inside the VPP and that is a graph scheduler. So graph scheduler is actually the taking care that all the, the process graph nodes which we have in VPP which are doing the, the specific uh, network functions are scheduled and, and executed and basically graph, graph scheduler is taking care that uh, vectors of packet which we are processing are delivered from one graph node to another graph node. And, and the, good, the, the, the thing with vector, vector uh, scheduler is that it basically, uh, it basically have a different type of nodes. We basically in VPP have three type of graph nodes. We have input nodes, we have the standard, uh, standard uh, feature nodes, and we finally have something which is called process nodes. Uh, graph scheduler uh, can basically schedule the, the, the input nodes in two ways. It can do interrupt mode uh, uh, polling. Or it can do interrupt mode or polling mode on input nodes. And that basically means that if you are running VPP uh, with a graph node, input node, which is a, a DVDK node, it will basically constantly pull the NIC. It will constantly try to pull the packets from the receiver rings on the NIC. And uh, whatever it, he gets from the, from, the, from the NIC, it will take into the vector and it will basically dispatch that vector to the next feature node. And of course, when you are increasing the load, so if your, if your traffic load is very low, 
it's very likely that uh, every time if you are constantly polling the interface, it's very likely that you will just find one packet in the ring. But then when you are increasing the load, that will start to, to, to increase. And then at some point, it will be two packets in, and then three, and, and, and we actually will go up to 256. And 256 is actually the maximum vector size we, are, we have today in VPP. It's, it's, it's something which is uh, found that it is an optimal value for as a result of testing of different values. So it's, there is no special reason besides really doing the, the performance testing and seeing what is the optimal vector size for in VPP. So, so today, the, the vector size in VPP can go up to 256 uh, packets. And when you are increasing the load, so if you, if you are fetching, if you are constantly fetching packets from the, from the NIC, and if you are getting one packet, you're actually doing the scalar packet processing, which I mentioned on, on my first slide because all what is, what is on that slide applies. But when you are increasing the load, then VPP starts to be more and more busy, and then it will start do vectorizing to basically start uh, having the, the vectors which are bigger than one packet. And that will automatically reduce per packet cost of processing. So as you are increasing the load, the, the VPP will be more effective on processing the, the, the workload. And, uh, and that goes up to 256. So if you really put a very big load on, on VPP, you will see that the, 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 the vector, vectors per packet rate on VPP will go up to the 256. It's, it goes very close to that number. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, what I mentioned also is that beside the polling, we also support interrupt mode, which is currently not true with DPDK. So DPDK is recently introduced the interrupt mode for, for some NICs. I think that they're not all supported. But basically all the infrastructure is there and we have the support for basically uh, dynamically uh, switching between the interrupt mode and, uh, and polling. So at some point when we realize that the vector size is big enough that we should start polling the interface, then we just basically just change the, the mode of operation of the specific input node from, from, uh, from interrupt to polling. So this is a very, very simple uh, graph of VPP nodes. And I will try to explain on this one actually how it works. So when we start on the top, we see the first graph node, which is, uh, which is called DPDK input. It's a basically input node, which I mentioned before. That guy is constantly polling, polling the NIC. It basically goes to NIC, he checks if there is any packet in the receiver ring, if there is a packet in, in the ring, one or more of them, it will grab all of them. And it will basically uh, say to, to, to graph dispatcher, okay, I'm done. I have that amount of packets. But before doing that, we already have some, some, some functionality here. And as you know, DPDK is actually quite smart in, in doing uh, recognition of the different packet types. So when we are receiving the, 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 the burst of packets in the from the DPDK, we already know that if the, the packets are received on some smart NIC, we already know that this packet is IPv4, this packet is IPv6, this packet is ARP and so on. So we can already make some decision how to dispatch specific packet to the next node. And that is actually what the DPDK input node is doing. It takes the, the vector of packets or burst of packets in, in DPDK language. It goes through, through all of them in the loop it tries to see which packets are IPv4 packets, which, pa which pa packets are IPv6, and so on. And then it will basically change the next node for every, it will set the next node for each packet. And then when he's done it, it will basically give the, all the vector of packets to the graph dispatcher. And then graph dispatcher will have information, okay, I got this frame of packets from, from, from this node, and now, now I need to dispatch them to the different graph nodes. So if packet is, is IPv4 packet, and we already have a flag that, that uh, IPv4 checksum is correct on this packet. We don't need to do checksumming, right? So those packets will basically follow this line. They will go to IPv4 um, uh, no checksum node, and IPv4 no checksum node is actually uh, first IP packet processing node in VPP. If, if the packet is received on some um, interface card uh, or NIC, which is, which is not smart enough to, rec to recognize IPv4 packets, then 
by, de by default, DPDK input will, will dispatch such packets to a node which is called Ethernet input. And then, instead of getting information from hardware about the packet, Ethernet input node will need to take a look at into ether type and decide if this is packet is IPv4, IPv6, and so on. And then, IPv4 packet recognized by, the, by Ethernet input node will be sent to IP input, but not this one. And difference between this one and this one is that this one doesn't do ch uh, checksum check. And of course, if he's not doing checksum check, there is a le less CPU cycle consumed by, by this graph node because there is no need to calculate checksum. If Nick is not smart enough to do that, or if maybe you are using some uh, virtualized uh, interface like AF packet or, or uh, TANTAP, in that case, you, you will not get information that this is the, the IPv4 packet with correct checksum. In that case, uh, the input node will send packet to Ethernet input, and then Ethernet input will send packet to IPv4 input. And IPv4 input is actually the guy who is doing the, the standard IP, IP <coughs> input checks, so TTL and uh, checksum and so on. And, uh, and same thing is here. And actually, if you take a look into the code, you will see that actually this guy and this guy are actually the, basically the same function with a small difference uh, in line in, in, in that function. And uh, of course, uh, after the input check, packet, if there is the, the standard IPv4 unicast packet, it will go to node which is called IPv4 lookup. IPv4 uh, for lookup node is actually the FIB lookup uh, node for IPv4. It's uh, basically using the M3 uh, hash lookup to find out the adjacency in the, in the FIB, which will be used for forwarding packet. So when you install the FIB entry to VPP, it will basically populate the, the M3 and it will populate the adjacency table. And then IPv4 lookup will basically have a hit and a result of that hit will be adjacency. Adjacency is a simple 64 byte uh, structure in memory, which contains information about layer to a rewrite and out outgoing interface. So, uh, As a result of the, of the lookup, you will know exactly what is the adjacency uh, assigned to the specific packet. And of course, the, we can have multiple uh, different adjacency types. So if we are just going to forward the packet to the specific interface, then we have this, this uh, graph node, which is called IPv4 rewrite transit. So it's a transit packet, it's not lo the, the, the locally destined packet, so it will basically it will basically, uh, we will just need to, uh, to update the layer two uh, data inside the packet and forward packet to the, to the outgoing interface. If packet is going to, uh, local to the VPP, then the result of the IPv4 lookup will be adjacency go, uh, pointing to the IPv4 lo uh, local node. And this is actually the way how we are treating the tunnel encapsulations. For example, if you are doing IPsec termination, and you're getting IPv4 packet, which contains the IP, IPv, IPsec uh, payload, uh, the IPv, IPsec uh, packet will follow this, this path. It will come, come to the lookup node, and lookup node will send packet to local node. And local node will basically use the protocol number of IP packet, and we can use protocol number, we can use uh, the UDP port and so on, to basically find out that this specific packet should go to IPsec decrypt, actually IPsec decap node. And IPsec decap node will then make a decision that this is the packet with, from the specific peer, so it will find, make a lookup to the, to the table where, the, where there is a, a security keys and, all, all other, uh, all, and other security parameters, and then, uh, IP, uh, then uh, IPsec input node will forward packets to the ESP decrypt node, which will actually decrypt the packet and send packet back, back to the uh, lookup node. So basically you can really circulate packets between the, the, the nodes. Of course, uh, every node is doing some operation on the packet. And with this approach, you can really reuse the, the path. And I think Ule will talk tomorrow uh, about map implementation, which is also interesting because we are actually converting the IPv4 to IPv6 packet and IPv6 to IPv4. And actually we have a packet flow through VPP graph nodes where we are basically sending one single packet 
is passing through the IPv4 fib, doing the encapsulation and then sending packet back to the IPv6 fib and then sending packet out. So it, 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 it is really fully flexible in the way that you can really change the code that you are completely changing the path which packets are flowing to the graph node. So right now, here we have only uh, IPv4 and IPv6 offload, but adding new one is really a few lines of code, uh, as long as you have the correct graph node to send the, the packets to. And actually for MPLS, we already have the MPLS uh, node, which can receive the, such packets. So it, it should not be a lot of work to enable the MPLS encapsulation on the, on the DVD game. Yeah, so IP, IPsec is something which we are working on with uh, colleagues from Intel. So uh, currently we are planning to add support for the Coletto Creek. It's uh, basically the 50 gig uh, IPsec accelerator. Idea is to basically create the new, gra new graph node because with those cards we basically need to, they're behaving like a NIC essentially. You need to send packets, you need to put packets to the ring. You need to, to, to tell the card that this, there is a ring of packets which, or a ring of buffers which you need to encrypt. And then you need to wait for, for packets to be encrypted and then to send them to the next node. So uh, you should not wait uh, for card to complete. So really you need to, to treat the, that encryption card in the similar way like you're treating Nick. You, you, give, you, you send the packets to the card and you jump to some other task. And when, you, when the card is complete, you either pull or receive interrupt from the card and then you take out, out the, the process, processed content and you, you dispatch that content to the, to the different node. So this essentially the, the crypto support will, with accelerator cards should be a, something very similar to DPDK input node in that case. It will be, I don't know, DPDK crypto input. Okay, so when we, we now we, <clears throat> the, the next point which is very important and, and when you, you start looking into the code you will actually see quite a lot of weird stuff inside. And more or less, this explains why. So if you remember that slide with number of clock cycles, this is actually what we are doing to try to, to stay as low as possible with number of clock cycles consumed per packet. First thing is about doing a branch prediction hints. For example, if you know that when you are doing the, the, the coding of the graph node or the processing loop, and you know that 99% that of the time, the specific if statement is going to be uh, true or false, you, you, you actually should say that to compiler. Because in that case, compiler will generate a different assembly code, which will be executed in the way that, that uh, I mean, it, it, it comes back to the, to, the, to the CPU architecture. So modern CPUs, they have a, quite a big pipeline. And in this pipeline, the CPU is processing the multiple instructions on the same time. So, uh, so branch is very bad for that because if you are missing the, the, the branch which CPU thinks that it will happen, that means the CPU needs to reset and restart processing the, the bunch of uh, instructions because what he did before was just not useful because he expected that you will go left, so he started processing packets on the, uh, going to the left, and the, the result of the, of, the, of the statement was right. So all the, the, the work he did for packets going to the left are basically just useless, and it needs to be discarded, and then CPU needs to restart processing the, the packets going to the, uh, the instructions going to the right. So with branch prediction, we are actually trying to help compiler and CPU to generate the code which will most of the time it will be a uh, hit, not miss. And in the code, you will basically see that there is a, something we are calling predict true and predict false, which is a, just a macro which helps the compiler to understand the, the branch prediction. Another thing is use of vector instructions. So there are some pieces of code which really are using the, the, the Intel intrinsics for, for different uh, vector, vector um, stuff. One of them is, for example, is IP classifier. So in some cases when you really need to, to do the parallel processing of multiple, if you want to do multiple operation, operations at the same time, uh, we are even using that kind of, uh, of co code to basically accelerate the processing. Uh, third one is prefetching, very important one which I mentioned before. So in the graph processing loop, what we are doing? 
we are always, when we are processing the first packet, before we start doing any work on the first packet, we tell the CPU, please prefetch the header of the second one. And that means that, that in the parallel where we are doing the work on the first packet, the, the memory subsystem in the CPU will try to uh, prefetch data from the memory or from the lower, uh, from, from the, uh, from the LLC to the, to the, to the, to the, to, to, to the L1 cache. And basically when we come to the second packet, the, the, the cache line which we prefetched is already warm. It's already in the, in the L1 cache. So instead of waiting 100 or 140 or I don't know how much ticks, uh, <clears throat> clock cycles to, to really get the data, the data will already be in the cache. So, so that is a very important trick we are always using in, in, in graph processing nodes. We are always prefetching, we are always prefetching the, the, the packets in advance. And of course, it depends on, on what you are actually trying to, to, to do. So in some cases, it's enough just to prefetch the, the, the buffer metadata. In some cases, you need to prefetch the IP header and so on. Uh, so, Prefetching is good, but also you should not pre prefetch too much. You should always try to prefetch as much as, as needed. Because every prefetch is, of course, taking some resources on the CPU, and of course, CPU cannot do thousands of prefetch on the same time. So, prefetching is a good idea, but really you need to be uh, moderate in, in using it. Not, don't prefetch everything, and because in that case, you will basically lose the effect of prefetching. <clears throat> Another important thing is speculation. So, for example, if you are doing the FIB lookup, you have, you receive packet, first packet, uh, and the, the first IP packet is hitting the FIB, FIB lookup. And FIB, FIB lookup is cost operation. It takes some CPU cycles to, to complete. And you did the FIB, FIB lookup for the first packet. You know what is the result of the FIB lookup. It's a, it's a basic adjacency for, um, index. And you know what is the destination address because you know it from the first packet. So there is a quite a good chance that second packet you received in the vector is going to the same destination. Maybe not, but there is a chance that it will. So it's much cheaper to really check if packet number two have the same IP address as a destination than doing the whole lookup. So what we are doing, we are speculating. We are speculating that second packet is actually going to the same destination like first one. And we just remember the result of the first lookup. It's a cached uh, result. And then we check the second packet and say, okay, this, this guy go to the same IP address, so we don't need to do a lookup. We already know what is the result of the lookup for that IP address. So we just take the, the result from the, from, the, from the cache and you, don't need to do a FIB lookup for that packet. And of course, if you have completely full random traffic, that will not help. But in, in, in real world, there is a, quite a good chance that you will receive few packets in the, in, in, in which are going to the same IP destination. In that case, you will basically accelerate for the, the lookup for them. And finally, most confusing one, when you look into the code, is dual looping. So every graph processing node actually have the, uh, every graph processing node is basically a loop. It's, it's a loop, loop going through vector of packets. So basically processing up to 256 packets in, 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 in one, in one uh, call of the, of the vector processing loop fu function. And dual looping is actually, we are trying to process in single loop two packets on the same time. And why we are doing this? because the modern CPUs actually have the, the multiple execution units. And, and the, if you want to squeeze out the best of the CPU, you really need to have a code which is equally distributed between them. And when you're processing two packets, you're basically spreading more load to different execution units on the CPU, and that helps actually to reduce the, the idle, idle capacity of the CPU of the, of the, of the, of the or the execution Unix inside the CPU, which are not utilized because they're not needed for, for one packet. So basically with dual looping, you are better utilizing the, the hardware resources inside the CPU. And if you take a look into the code, you will actually see that it's very 
it's basically every, every single line is duplicated. You will see uh, B, B0, B1, B0, B1, uh, A0, A1. And so every variable in, inside the loop is, is duplicated. And basically, it's about first and second packet. And then finally, because it can happen that your that the last packet is just one, we need to have a, the same loop function for single packet. So that is really confusing for people because you will see in the code that every loop, uh, every function, uh, node function is actually having the dual looped version, and then after that one you will have the single looped version. So basically, uh, what is Quite a good practice when you are creating the new graph node is to first write the single looped function. When you are, when you are uh, sure that everything works fine, that it's good, optimized, then you can basically du duplicate that function and just duplicate every single line in, inside it to, to create the du dual loop one. Okay, uh, VPP platform support. Uh, as I already mentioned, we have support for, for for really different platforms. We are trying not to be stick to any single architecture. And uh, of course, main, main uh, development is happening around uh, on Intel architectures. And, uh, but also we are doing stuff, support for different ones. So uh, one of them is, for example, ARM. We have working a VPP on the Thunder X, which is the 64-bit ARM architecture. Uh, we have PowerPC version, MIPS version, and so on. Uh, we can do 32-bit and 64-bit applications. And uh, some, it's something which is quite new in VPP. It's basically runtime selection of optimal binary code. So you know that today compilers are quite smart in producing the, the, the binary code. And if you have the application which is a binary, it's distributed like Ubuntu Debian packaging, package, <clears throat> Then that package should work on different CPUs. And you, you need either to select the older CPU, which doesn't have the, the latest instructions, especially the vector instructions, or you, you can select the, the new CPU. If you tell the compiler that produce the binary for the latest CPU, that application will just not work on the old one. If <clears throat> you uh, tell up a compiler to, to generate code for the old architecture, like Nehalem or Westmer or something like this, then you cannot use AVX2, for example. And that means that compiler cannot use AVX2 uh, instructions to basically optimize the code. And what we come up with as a solution to this problem is basically a kind of multi-versioning. Every graph node is actually a function, and we are calling that graph node as a pointer to that function. So we just compile every, the, the, the important uh, critical path functions inside VPP two times or three times, four times, and depending on what microarchitecture you want to support. So we have the, the one uh, instance of the, of the node processing function, which is built for uh, very old CPUs, which is default one. But then on the runtime, we can basically do CPU ID, detect if the, the CPU supports AVX2, for example. And if that happens, we are basically just swapping the pointer to the graph node processing function. And when we do that, we basically, uh, tell the graph scheduler to use optimized AVX2 optimized version of the graph node processing function instead of the default one. So basically, you can use the same binary on two different systems, and uh, the, if you run it on the, on the Haswell system, it will basically use AVX2. If you run the same binary on the, on the Nehalem or Westmer, you will basically have the graph functions doing the, not using the AVX2 instructions. Another important thing which is quite con uh, confusing for, for beginners in, in VPP is that we are really not using much of the standard C libraries. And we have something which is called VPP infrastructure library. It was called CLIB before, but we, we renamed it because of clash with the, with the CLIB. And basically all the stuff we are using, including printing the text and everything is basically coming from, from our libraries, not from uh, standard uh, uh, C libraries. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have support for PCI, PCI device drivers. So we are using mainly DPDK, but still the PCI support is there. And actually, it's, it, we can, it's sometimes useful for doing, we can add some, for example, some support for some, some NIC which is not supported in DPDK or, or another case is, for example, uh, I, I was playing a few weeks ago with, uh, with the DMA engine, which is on, on, the, on the Intel chips. It's called Crystal Beach. And 
with use, by using the VPP uh, PCI device driver infrastructure, you can really talk to the, to the PCI device directly. And uh, I managed to do the direct memory DMA through this uh, uh, Crystal Beach DMA engine on, on, the, on the CPU by using the native VPP uh, device driver support for PCI devices. And yeah, last one, as I said, Linux only today. Uh, there is some interest from the community to really port VPP on the on the BSD. Any questions? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Regarding DPDK, so um, you can compile your nodes for AVX2 and uh, uh -huh. legacy, I would say. But uh, do you have several versions of DPDK, or do you have to make no, a choice? No. So on uh, DPDK is something which uh, we are trying to. Actually, I, I exchanged some emails with uh, with some people uh, in Intel about this about this thing. So it will be nice to have the same, because that, that, that is the generic problem, not only for VPP, but that, that's also a problem generic for the distributions. So if you take Ubuntu version of DPDK today, you will basically get DPDK, which is not optimized for, uh, for the latest AVX2 instructions. So, so what we are doing today, we are basically uh, on VPP, the DPDK is compiled to support the standard SEC 4.2 instructions. So it's a basic Nehalem and, and newer CPUs. And graph nodes are optimized to do AVX2 if AVX2 support is uh, detected on the on the runtime. Uh, have you made a benchmark to compare on Haswell? Yeah, there is. The, the, uh, we, we see some improvement. I don't remember the numbers, but there is there there is a. No, we, we can see the improvement in in using those two instructions. Thank yeah, you. The instruction sets. So basically, without and with AVX2. As I said, we are really focused on Intel right now. Uh, we are trying to get one power PC to really test the, the how it works on, on PowerPC. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, uh, maybe the, the what we are doing with dual looping is maybe not all fully optimized for a, for a, for a PowerPC. I mean, even on, between the different Intel architectures, there is a difference, right? The Haswell have a completely doubled the, the, the load store and uh, throughput. So maybe in some cases, dual looping can be quad looping just because of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, at some point you need to stop because, because otherwise you will have the special code for every single architecture. So, uh, so far it looks like dual looping really brings the benefits on, on the most of the platforms without really making it very complicated. Okay, a bit, uh, a bit about uh, VPP components. So VPP is built as a set of libraries. And as I already mentioned, we have the first library which is called uh, VPP Infra. This is really the low level functions which we are using in the rest of the code. So what we have here is uh, things like vector pools, uh, hashes, uh, bitmaps, and so on. So basically it's really, if you take a look into the, the, the code, you will see that we are heavily using the, the for example, vectors as a, for everything, including the strings, because vector is, nothing, is not much more than a simple uh, extensible array. And I think Pierre, you you are you will cover the infra stuff uh, yeah. tomorrow, right? So you, you will go into details. So, so we're all up right yes. So Pierre will go into details about uh, all these uh, data types we are using. Uh, mainly, we are using the vectors, bitmaps, uh, pools, and so on. Then we have something which is called vlib, and vlib is a general non-networking function. So graph scheduler is is in vlib. It really the it, it is really the place where we are defining buffers, uh, vector uh, vectors of, of packets, so actually vectors of frames of, of <coughs> vectors of buffers and so on. So all non-networking stuff is in VLIB, including the initial memory initialization and uh, PCI support and uh, CLI and everything is in VLIB. Then we have the special uh, library which is called VLIB API. It's related to the to the binary API, which I will discuss later. And finally, we have VNet. So if you are developing the, the new network function, uh, then you will probably just go to, to VNet because this is the place where you have the, the all the networking stuff, including from, from internet to IP to everything else. And finally, because all those guys are actually the libraries and they are, uh, they are shared libraries, when you, when you compile a VPP, you will actually see that there are four different shared libraries. Then finally, we have something which we are calling container application, it's a VP, which is called VPP. And that is actually the executable we are using. So uh, VPP is actually the executable which is 
linked to those guys and using them to, to, to basically be application. Uh, build system is a built weird. It's a bit weird, I would say. Uh, there is a long history of it. So, so actually, the 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 VPP was before built really to have a build system to build complete system from the scratch, including the the kernel, Linux kernel, uh, compiler, toolchain, everything. And it, it was actually the huge package which was building the, the everything. It is, so it was really about doing the, the embedded uh, stuff. Uh, when we open source, we basically get rid of a lot of that stuff and basically we removed, but still we will see that every single component is actually a small auto tools project. And we have the something which is called eBuild. It's actually our internally developed build system for VPP which is uh, basically using the, the, the auto build on the sub projects to compile them, to stage the, the, the files to the specific directories and to finally link everything together. And also uh, today eBuild is also taking care for packaging so you can create the Debian or Red Hat images by, by using uh, eBuild make files. So if you look into the, the make file, you will see it's actually quite huge and there is a lot of stuff which is which you may ask, why is this here? <laughs> but it, it, there is history about it. So it's really about uh, history. Maybe at some point we will just decide to, to move to something which is newer because this, this is really coming from 2000 and something. And, and what is also important, we have different platforms uh, in VPP. So, Platform is basically a way to tell to eBuild how to, what what to compile, what to to link, and what to package. And yeah, most of the time you will just use platform, which is just called VPP. But then we have some other guys here, and I listed a few of them. We have a VPP Lite, which is actually VPP without uh, DPDK. It's uh, it's it, it's kind of. Uh, convenient way to, to do some VPP testing and uh, and in cases when you don't need to allocate uh, huge pages and uh, you don't need the NIC support, for example, if you're just using Tantap or, or AF packet interfaces, then you really don't need a DPDK device driver le level and then the, the VPP Lite basically just compiles faster and, and, and runs faster. Then uh, we have Will, which is something, which is a Cisco product and there is a special version of VPP for it. Not big one, but there are a few minor changes in, in the code related to this one. We have ARM32 support. We have PowerPC support and ThunderX. So basically, uh, when you are using the eBuild system to build VPP, you can select which platform you are building for, and based on this selection, the, you will get the different executable. But 99% of the time, you will just use platform equals, equals VPP. Okay, then the device drivers very quickly to go through what we have today in VPP from device drivers. Uh, we have, uh, of course, DPDK as a first one and most mostly used one. So DPDK is actually the only device driver which is today uh, really built to be uh, multi-threading uh, safe. Other stuff should be, it's something which we need to work on to really enable the, the multi-threading. So DPDK is really the the, the our biggest focus here, and we are mainly using DPDK as device driver for VPP. But there are a few others. We have a Tuntap, which is basically using the standard uh, IOCTL interface on, on Linux to create the Tuntap interfaces, if you are just need to do some testing. We have a VPP as a vhost user server. So basically, uh, currently we have two versions. We have the legacy vhost user driver, which is the old one, and we also support vhost user uh, from DPDK. So there is a, actually a, a switch, command line switch you, you can use to basically switch from one to another, but CLI is completely identical. So, so you can basically really compare the DPDK vhost user and, uh, and uh, old native uh, VPP vhost user implementation. Then AF Packet is a basically Linux AF Packet interface, uh, very similar to Tantap, but a bit faster because we are not forced to use uh, uh, one system call per, per packet. 
Then we have a native driver for NetMap. Uh, I, I think you heard about NetMap is basically a technology we developed in by Luigi Rizzo in Italy. It's, uh, it's something which is coming in all the BSD uh, implementations. And also there is a NetMap driver for Linux, but it's not part of the Linux distribution. Then we have something which is called SSVM. It's a kind of prototype device driver in VPP, which is used as a shared memory interface between two instances of VPP. And this driver is actually reusing the binary API infrastructure to do a exchange of packets between the two VPP instances. So it's a kind of legacy interface which can be used between two VPPs, for example, one VPP in the container and another one on the host. And finally, uh, we have all old PCI drivers. Right now in the code, you will see that there is just one. We are not encouraging people to use it because it's not maintained. We are focused, as I said, on DPDK drivers, but we have also, as a kind of sample, we have the Intel Niantic uh, driver. So it actually works and uh, it works actually quite fast. This is what is available on the device driver level in VPP today. Questions? So is it that you have a, a more generic uh, API than DPDK for in inputting packets? So that you can do, let's say, VPP input, and then you can get packets from either DPDK, Tuntap, uh, VHOS user? Yes, yeah. every driver here is actually an input node. Ah, OK. So this guy is DPDK-input. This guy is Tuntap input, VHOS user input, AF packet input, NetMap input, SSVM input, and this guy is called IG, I, IXG dash input. And you can really, uh, when you start VPP, you can see that, that input nodes are, are in polling mode or, or in interrupt mode. For example, this guy is fully, fully uh, supporting the interrupt mode. So if you are using, a, if you try to use this, this, this driver, you will see that VPP will not consume CPU at all. But when you start traffic, it will basically switch to the, to the polling dynamically when the, the vector size increases above the, the threshold. So basically, device driver for VPP is just an a input node. And that input node can, can talk with hardware. And, you, and it can talk with hardware, in, like in this case, using the PCI infrastructure we have in VPP. Uh, are you using the uh, DPDK MBUF? Or are you creating yes. your own structure to process packets? We have the, the native VPP structure, which is called VLib, VLib buffer. And when you are running VPP uh, as with DPDK, we are actually using the, the, the private metadata field inside the DPDK MBUF to store VLib buffer. So if you're using DPDK, you will see that actually the VLib buffer metadata is inside DPDK, DPDK MBUF. Actually, it's, it's adjacent. It, it comes after the, the, the DPDK MBUF, there is a VLIP buffer. And if you are running VPP without DPDK, then we have just, uh, we are allocating memory by, by, by our memory allocator, and then we are using the only VLIP uh, buffer to, to store the data. Uh, so you don't have any conversion cost between different structures? Um, no, no, not really, no. Thank you. Because we are maintaining both. So we basically, DPDK input will just take the, some information from MBUF and it will add some fields in, into, the, the, into the native header. So we are, and on the TX side again. So most of the graph nodes are, are not even aware and actually they should not be aware of uh, uh, DPDK MBUF. They are dealing with VLIB uh, because all functions are using the VLIB uh, MBUF. And if you really want to do uh, something with the DPDK MBUF, then you can do that. But then you need to, to basically create the code which handles situation when you don't have a DPDK linked in. So the best case is really try to use the, the really buffer uh, for all your buffer stuff you're doing. Okay, uh, plugins, uh, as my colleagues already mentioned. So we have the, the plugin infrastructure. And basically for VPP, plugin is just a shared library. So like we have VLib or VNet, we can have also the, the, the plugin, which is a shared library. So on the startup, VPP is actually taking a look, a look into the slash, uh, slash lib slash VPP 
and it tries to, to go to all shared libraries in that uh, directory. There is a detection mechanism to avoid uh, something uh, bogus inside the directory. So basically, uh, we, we will refuse to, to, to dynamically link a plugin which, does, which is not, doesn't have uh, some data structures inside to avoid uh, that somebody put something else to that directory. And basically, very, very early on the, on the VVP runtime, the, the VVP will load in the, and, and link in the, the shared libraries. And when they are in, we are basically allowed to do, it's basically the, the, the native uh, VVP application. So there is no performance drawback if you're using plugins versus uh, using the native VPP code because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically the same code. And uh, as already mentioned with plugins, you can do a lot of things. You cannot change the, the behavior of the existing graph nodes, but you can create the own graph node. For example, if you want to create a plugin, which is, I don't know, taking the VXLAN packets in, you can do that by simply subscribing, telling to VPP, okay, send me all UDP packets. Uh, IP, IP4 uh, local node should send me all the UDP packets going to this specific UDP port to my node. And we did, we did that kind of registration, basically plugin is telling uh, VPP what he needs to get from, from VPP. And when he, when he does that, it will basically automatically start getting the the, the, the graph dispatcher will start sending the, the relevant packets to, the, to your plugin code. So basically, it's, uh, the plugin stuff is really the uh, fast and, and usable uh, as the native code, unless you need to do something, some tweaking of the existing VPP nodes. So it's really about creating the, the, the new one. I can add leaves in runtime, mm -hmm. but if I want to change a branch, then I need to restart VPP, is that right? The, the question is that, you need, some t somehow, you need to have a way to tell the previous node that you are interested in some packets. Some nodes have a native support for that. One of them is, for example, is, is IPv4 uh, input node, which have the API, which you call from the plugin saying, okay, Mr. IPv4 input node, I'm interested in receiving UDP packets going to port 2000. And if you have such situation, you can basically modify the, the, the whole tree in the way that, uh, that existing IPv4 input uh, local node, which is part of the main VPP, will start sending you packets. So there is no need, uh, you don't need to change anything in that case. If you want to do, like we discussed previously, if you want to do a new encapsulation support in DPDK input to address MPLS packets, that is something you cannot do from, from plugin. Because that really means that you need to change the, the input, DPDK input, node and change the code inside that one to start processing that packets. So yes, so there are some limitations. Uh, some of them, I mean, uh, what we support today is quite good for creating new features. We can certainly add more. One good example is uh, fib. So today uh, you cannot create the custom fib type, which will be, uh, which will be, uh, which you can, do in, in plugin, you cannot create the new fib type and tell to, to the, the lookup node to send you packets based on the new adjacency inside the, the fib. But th that is, for example, something which can be fixed. If there is, is really the need that some plugin should really install the, the customized adjacencies to the, to, the fib, to, the, to, the, to the adjacency table. And so on. So yeah, so in some cases, yeah. Uh, for standalone features, generally, we are perfectly fine to, to create the plugins. And those plugins, of course, uh, because of the, the licensing we are using, it's perfectly fine to, to distribute them as a binary, pa binary package. So if somebody wants to, to create something which is value add, which is corporate uh, value add, and he wants to sell it, he can just do it as a binary package. We, 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 rec we recently also created the, the signature infrastructure. So basically the idea is to really have a way to, to sign uh, plugins, to avoid uh, bogus plugins to be installed in the MVP very quickly about CLI. So there is a CLI infrastructure. So if you are creating the new, new function, you don't need to take care about CLI input and everything. Uh, we, are, we are calling CLI a debug CLI. Why we are calling the debug CLI? Because we are encouraging people to use binary API. Uh, debug CLI is really for debugging and troubleshooting the, the VPP. And it's used mainly when you are building the new feature, but at the end you want to have some, something outside of VPP to do to, to program VPP programmatically, and uh, for that we have binary API. So debug CLI is just a helper for people, and and uh, 
We already have a support for, for listening uh, on, on TCP port, uh, or you can use the, your console for, for debug CLI. So very quickly, binary API is fast and efficient shared memory interface to, to talk with uh, northbound applications. So basically it allows us to, to, to really to, to get uh, updates coming from the north to the VPP and that is actually what all agents are, are using, uh, like Honeycomb. So uh, binary API was built with a few things on the mind. It should be really fast and it should be easy to debuggable. And actually, uh, um, what we are currently able to do is really about programming more than 1 million routes per, uh, per second on VPP today over that interface. So it's a really fast and it needs to be fast because it's a data plane so you cannot avoid that your API is taking uh, hours or seconds to, to, do, to, to do some work. Uh, it, it was done over the, the shared memory interface. There is a lot of uh, code built uh, inside the, that, that uh, component in VPP and it's really even hard to, to, to read the code because it's really uh, complex. But uh, the cool thing is that you really, you, you can use the binary API uh, from the different language bindings. So what we have today is is standard uh, C library to talk with VPP. We have the Java, and that is used by Honeycomb, and then we have uh, Python bindings. And creating the new binding is quite easy because we have the, the special API definition file, and what you need to, basically you need to just gen generate the new bindings of, of the API definition file. And uh, of course, plugins can do their, their, their own APIs, so Basically, your plugin, of course, needs to communicate also to the to the northbound. In that case, you need support for the for the binary API. And this is quite important. If something go, goes wrong and you need to debug it, this will save your life <laughs> because you can really tell VPP to record all the binary API messaging coming from the northbound, and you can reply. And even if you have a bug in VPP. Instead of reproducing all your orchestration and provisioning and everything in your lab to debug the issue, you can just ask guys, okay, can you send me the, the API trace? You get the API trace and you can, you can reply the API trace to VPP. And by replying the API trace, you basically, you are basically getting the same effect like really having all the northbound systems talking to VPP. So it, it's a really cool thing that you can really reply uh, the sequence of API messages received from the from the northbound client. So this is the sample of the, of the API definition. It's a basically one text file with all the APIs. Uh, it is using the basically the, the C coding. So this is, for example, this is the, the API which adds or removes the route from FIB. And yeah, we have U32, U8 and, and, and so on. So it's, it's really simple to, to read. And out of, out of the, this, you can create the Java bindings or Python bindings or whatever you need. And finally, multi-threading. I will have another session about multi-threading. So very quickly, I will cover it here. So uh, VPP uh, is using something which is called embarrassing parallelism. We try to do something with running different workloads on the different cores and so on. But the, the, the conclusion was really that you can make this working for the specific case, but when you have a generic the workloads and or if you have the workloads which are changing like that happened in the real life, it's really hard to, to really maintain such system because the slowest component in the path is actually your, is your limitation. So we fall back to something which, which we are calling a embarrassing parallelism uh, solution, which basically we are running the VPP graph scheduler on, on different cores. So when packet enters the, the VPP on the input inter interface, it will, all, it will stay, stay all the time on the same core. We are not trying to, to bounce packet from one uh, CPU core to another during the, his walk through the graph nodes. If, if it hits the, the, the worker thread number three, all the execution or all the work done on that specific packet will be done on the, on the worker tree. And then, Basically, we can use some harder uh, hashing mechanisms like RSS on the NIC to basically spray the, the load between the multiple uh, cores. 
And that work works actually quite good. Uh, Maciek will, will, will be showing the, the, the system with uh, how many interfaces? 12 And how many cores? Uh, two, two main yes, so basically we are really in, in such setup, we are, we are really scaling almost linearly uh, with, with this approach. Uh, and last thing to mention here, so I will come back to the, the threading and there will be a whole session about this, so I don't want to go much into details uh, now, but the, the, the another thing to mention is really that we are NUMA, NUMA aware, so we are trying to use the local uh, buffers on the, on the same CPU sockets where the, where the, the VPP is running, so, so to avoid uh, crossing the QPI bus on the, on the, on the CPU.